Hello, welcome to Mind Chat, the podcast with the lowest production values and the greatest philosophy. I'm Philip Goff. Welcome, I'm Keith Frankish. How are you doing, Keith? Long time since we've done this. It is indeed. Uh, yes, no, I'm, I'm okay. Um, got a few things going on, but uh, uh, surviving. Uh, how about you? How are you? Well, I've got COVID, and uh, so I've been a bit knocked out the last couple of days, but feeling a little bit more back to normal today, so thought there's been enough delays, might as well. The show must go on, <laughs> although I can't remember how to work any of the technology, so hopefully th this is uh, recording and broadcasting and everything, but no, pretty good, pretty good. So, uh, so what have we got going on today? Anything exciting? Well, this is, I think, officially the uh, Christmas special. Uh, wow! Oh, it's a good job I, I bought my Christmas jumper then. I noticed, yes, uh, that is that is most... Although, Father Christmas is, uh, the, he's supposed to have flashing eyes, but the batteries in one of them have worn out, worn out so he's just kind of winking. There's some moral for us there, I think. Well... Um, let me. Shall I explain the format? Uh, the Christmas Go special. We have we have a long established tradition established uh, since well last Christmas of making this a debate between uh, what we both agree are the two most important positions on consciousness, namely illusionism and panpsychism. And uh, so we're going to do that again, but this time. We're going to, you and I, Philip, we're going to take a back seat, aren't we? And we're going to invite in two guests to defend uh, those positions. We're going to invite in Luke Roloffs, who will defend the panpsychist position, and Francois Camera, who will defend the illusionist position. And uh, I'm, and so uh, they are going to begin by uh, by making the case for the two positions, and then. We'll broaden it out into a into a discussion. I think that sounds like a great plan, don't you? That sounds pretty good. Pretty good. I'm happy with that. Let's go for that. Well, yes, indeed. But uh, before we start, though, I think are you going to just tell us a little bit about what we've got coming up? Right. Yes, week? we've got lots of exciting guests booked in next week. We have another mind chat. I'm very excited about next week's guest. Do you want to know who next week's guest is? Uh, no, 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 none other than. Frank Jackson, Frank Jackson, who came up with perhaps the most influential argument against materialism of all time, the knowledge argument featuring black and white fairy, black and white fairy, black and white Mary, blame and the COVID. Let's it didn't work. Um, but <laughs> for any errors, maybe you'll today, be able to blame. convince him that it worked after all. Yeah, so he came up with this most influential argument against materialism of all time then decided it didn't work. I do have a secret hope that this time, 20 years later, I can persuade him that it actually works in the end. Um, so that's what we've got next Wednesday. Tune in for that. Then uh, February, we, we're going to have an episode on experimental philosophy. This is... Um, what goes on here is for, those, for people who are sceptical of trusting philosophers' intuitions on philosophical matters... What experimental philosophers do is they do big surveys for the general public to try and work out their intuitions on philosophical matters rather than trusting so-called professional philosophers. And uh, we're having on uh, Edward, Edward Macquarie. And part of what he's done here is done big surveys testing people's intuitions on the hard problem and the concept of consciousness and zombies and so on. And he reckons he can show on on this basis that the kind of worries philosophers like me have pushing the hard problem and so on are a little bit of a pseudo problem, a little bit of a made up by philosophers thing. So we're going to have him on, but also Michelle Liu, who's done a lot of work responding to him, challenging his experimental philosophy work. So we'll have a little a little debate there. Um, does that sound exciting? And then I think we're going to have a little bit of a break, aren't we, for the next couple of months? You're you're uh, got got a book to finish. We'll, we'll see how, th how things uh, 
the pan out, but uh, we might not. We, we might be able to. Fit, we might be able to fit one in. We'll see how things go. But uh, it is going to be right. and then in and then in May we've got the wonderful Eric Schwitzgabel booked in, uh, one of the greatest philosophers of mind of the present moment. Maybe talking about what do we get? All sorts of possibilities there. Possibly oh, so many about, possibilities yeah. with Eric. Whether consciousness could be indeterminate, whether it could be indeterminate, whether or not, say, a snail has an inner life. So, lots of fun things to look forward to. So, Absolutely. yeah, as always, if you're enjoying these programs, please do like, subscribe, comment, review, and so on. Should we get on with it then? I think you better. You better. Let's 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 go. Let's. Let's, Let's welcome Luc and Francois. Hello, Hello. welcome to Hello. my chat. Hey there. Hi. Well, Hi, so Luke, Luke Roloffs is leading, Dr. Luke Roloffs, a leading proponent of panpsychism, currently research fellow at the Center of Mi for Mind, Brain and Consciousness in <coughs> New York University, which is in New York, uh, author yeah. of the excellent Combining Minds, one of the best things to read on panpsychism and the combination problem, and not just not just not just panpsychism. Thinking about mental combination in a broader context. Also got another book on consciousness and value, consciousness and the foundations of ethics with Oxford University Press, as well as loads and loads of other really really great articles. Um, welcome to Mind Chat, Luke. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, and Merry Christmas, I suppose. And you've like also a... made a lot of effort with the Christmas. I believe you have some other Christmas things on, not just the jumper I mean, that I'm, we can see right now. I'm wearing uh, a cat Christmas sock and a reindeer Christmas sock because I had too many sets of Christmas socks uh, and wow. Christmas pajama trousers. The yeah, see, panpsychists the, the, the have clearly pan made more of an effort here, yes. The panpsychists have made a lot more effort with the Christmas garb. I'm not sure what we should make of that, but... And uh, our other guest is Francois Camera. Um, Francois did his PhD in France at the Sorbonne, uh, graduating in, I think, 2016. And then he, um, since then, he's held postdoc positions in Belgium, Germany, and the U.S., He's currently finishing a postdoc at New York University and uh, at the Center for Mind, Brain and Consciousness. And he's currently in the process of relocating to Europe um, um, to uh, Bochum in Germany. And his, most of his research, the, the bulk of his research has been on consciousness. And uh, in particular, he's explored and defended illusionism very effectively, I may say. Uh, he's also interested in introspection and the relation between Philosophy of Mind and Ethics. It's a very interesting paper on the ethical implications of illusionism. Uh, he's also interested in experiment, experimental philosophy of consciousness and the relation between the philosophy of mind and the philosophy of technology. So, a fantastic person here to, to represent the illusionist cause. Uh, thanks for having me, uh, for the invite, and I'm very much looking forward to the, to the debate. Excellent. Um, I'm noticing uh, comments aren't coming up. Um, Keith, if, m maybe if you could explain the format to today, I'll just check to make sure we're actually broadcasting. Um, okay, I, I, I think we are, but uh, yes, the format is going to be like this. We're going to begin with um, presentations, short presentations, 20 minutes from, um, I think Luke's going to go first, and then Francois. Uh, we'll, and we'll present, um, Luke will present the case for panpsychism and Francois will present the case for illusionism. And then Francois and Luke will have a debate between themselves, 10 minutes. Uh, Francois will uh, um, cross-examine Luke and then Luke will have 10 minutes to cross-examine Francois. And then uh, Philip and I will, will join in and um, I'll... Uh, Put a few questions to Luke and Philip will put a few questions to Francois, and then maybe we will we will that, that we will merge this all into, into a, a short uh, general discussion at the end, and then uh, I will post a Twitter poll to um, definitively decide once and for all who's right, and uh, that will settle the matter for all time, and uh, we can all go home and do something else. 
Sounds like a good plan. Okay, so we do seem to be broadcasting. For some reason, the comments aren't coming through to StreamYard, but I can check back to... Um, I can see comments on YouTube. So YouTube comments, yeah. So, so, yeah, we should hopefully, while the Twitter poll's going on, we should have time for some audience questions. Indeed. Uh, yeah, so should, should we get on with it? Let's so go. Luke's going to kick us off with the indisputable... Sorry shouldn't be biased here with the with the case for panpsychism take it away luke all right thanks yeah i i'll probably make a disputable case or at least we'll we'll find out when people dispute it immediately afterwards um but yeah so i i guess i see panpsychism as the logical endpoint of taking seriously two ideas which are i think both you know very plausible and very popular among philosophers but which are often thought to be in tension with one another one of which pushes people towards physicalism, one of which pushes people towards dualism. Um, so the, the first of those ideas, and here I, I suspect that Francois and Keith will find a lot to agree with, um, is the, the kind of striking unity of the world revealed by natural science. So, uh, you know, for uh, some number of centuries now, depending how you date it, scientific investigation seems to have been revealing that all of the differences between things in the world are ultimately are structural and are differences of degree. So, you know, you take one of us, one of us humans, and you take, you know, various sorts of animals, plants, rocks, rivers, tables, chairs, stars, planets, you know, they appear vastly different in what kinds of things they can do and how they behave. Some of them come on podcasts, most of them don't. Um, but it turns out that under scientific examination, they really do seem to be uh, the, the same sorts of basic elements, the same forces, the same laws, just arranged differently. You, know, you could take me and just rearrange the, the bits of me to get a cloud of vapor that could drift around in the sky. Uh, you could take a cloud and you could rearrange its component particles and make me. Um, and you know, and that, that really suggests that, that you know, if, even if I appear to be conscious, I'm not, I don't contain some special ingredient, some extra soul or immaterial kind of fairy dust sprinkled on top of, of physical matter. I'm just the same physical matter as everything else. Um, and moreover, um, these differences are differences of degree. You know, in the process of rearranging my particles into a cloud, you know, you could identify indefinitely many intermediate stages uh, that are somewhat human-like, somewhat cloud-like. A lot of the ones in the middle aren't going to be very stable. Uh, you know, if you remove all of my skin and bones, then if you, like, allow time to, to run, I'm going to dissolve, probably, and then I'll become much less human-like. Um, but at least for a moment, you could, you could have any number of intermediate steps. Um, and a lot of people, I think, they, they look at this fact, and they also bring in the assumption that all those other things out there, the, the clouds and, and tables and chairs and rocks and rivers, are utterly devoid of consciousness. There's nothing it's like that there's no, no subjective aspect to any of that stuff. That it is purely objective, that if you had a purely objective description that you know, specified the location and energy level and uh, velocity of each particle, uh, you would have a complete description. Nothing would be left out. And so they think, uh, you know, well, if, if I'm fundamentally akin to everything else in the universe and everything else in the universe outside, you know, us humans and maybe some animals is uh, utterly objective with no subjective side to it, then it seems to follow that I must be in some fundamental level devoid of consciousness. So I don't have consciousness at the base level. And if, if I am conscious, then it must be superficial at best, illusory at worst. Um, I suspect that Francois will delve in a bit more to those different options and why you might prefer, you know, one or the other of these kind of basically uh, reductive views about consciousness. Um, but that, I think, is what lies behind a lot of the appeal of, of physicalism, is this sense that, like, the universe just seems to be deeply unified. Um, but, of course, a lot of people are not physicalists. Um, particularly because they tend to be attracted to this, this other idea that I think often pushes people towards dualism, um, 
which is often called something like realism about consciousness or strong realism or anti-reductionism about consciousness, um, which is the idea that there's, there's a subjective aspect to our existence that can't be reduced to or explained in terms of any purely objective description. Um, so I think Philip mentioned, you know, Mary, the black and white fairy, um, you know, locked in a, in a black and white room who was, you might have learned every physical fact there is to know about how the human brain responds to uh, wavelengths of light and yet has never actually experienced seeing red, seeing blue, seeing the various chromatic colors. Um, and it seems very compelling that, you know, even though she knows everything objective, there's something she doesn't know. Um, and it's often, uh, Jackson actually has a, a different thought experiment appears in the same paper where we, you know, if I know that someone else sees a different range of colors than me, they report that they see colors that aren't, you know, red, yellow, blue, or any combination. Um, I might be curious, well, what does that color look like? And it looks like I could study their brain and map their behavioral dispositions as much as I want without ever finding out. There's something that I still don't know, is what does the color look like? Um, and it looks like the only way I can find that out is to actually alter myself, you know, to, to not just stand apart and study this other being that has the experience, but to change myself so that I can internally have this experience. Um, and so if you think that this subjective aspect, you know, is, is both real and irreducible to anything purely objective, um, and if you, again, make that, that starting assumption that most of the universe is devoid of any subjective aspect, then I think it's natural to be led to some sort of dualism, to think, well, the material things out there are purely objective. Um, there's, there's nothing subjective to say about, about them. Um, but I know that I'm not like that. I know that I have this irreducible subjectivity. And so I must have something extra. There must be something going on in me as a human being that is fundamentally different to what's going on in all these other material objects. Um, there's something that sets us apart. Um, maybe it's a, an immaterial substance, maybe it's a special law of nature that only kicks in under very specific circumstances, but there's, there's some sort of discontinuity within the world. Um, and so that's the, the, the dualist position, which I think has to kind of sacrifice or go against the, the, the unity revealed by natural science just like the physicalist position has to sacrifice or, or deny uh, the, the immediate evidence of our own awareness of, of, of being conscious. Um, and panpsychism, uh, I think, is what you get if you take both of these ideas seriously, but you reject that, as, that common assumption between physicalists and dualists that all the, the inanimate things around us, most of the, the, the material furniture of the universe, is utterly non-conscious, is devoid of, of any subjective aspect. Um, and I think when you when you start thinking about it reflectively, it's, it's very odd that we're so confident about this because, you know, it's not a claim about how things look to us. It's not a claim about what it's like to be us. It's a claim about what it's like or isn't like to be other things. And that's the kind of thing, the kind of claim that you'd, you'd generally be the most cautious about. Um, and I think when you when people say why they make this assumption, um, often people start by saying, look, you know, rocks and chairs and tables and clouds, they don't act like they're conscious. They don't behave the way that I would expect if I thought that they were conscious. Um, and I think there is something important there, but I think it's routinely overstated. Um, and the reason for that, going back to, you know, thinking about Mary and the, the various people who are struggling to understand experiences they haven't had, is that our our ability to understand consciousness in other beings is always tied to our own experience. It's tied to what's familiar to us. So when there are experience types that we have had that we're familiar with, um, I think we have a pretty good kind of basis for confidence in the thought that like, if something else has that sort of experience, that sort of state, then I should be able to recognize it um, in its behavior. And sometimes that will be harder than other times. So uh, a notable recent example is uh, people with a severe brain damage who appear from a kind of casual observation to have uh, no behavior that indicates any kind of conscious state. 
but who turned out uh, when brain scanning technology was used to be able to uh, respond appropriately to uh, instructions given to them by a, a, a doctor. So when they were told, imagine you're playing tennis, we could detect a lot of activity in their uh, motor areas, the areas that would be active when you were imagining playing tennis. Um, in particular, they, uh, okay. So that, that's an interesting example to think about. The point I'm making is um, we needed to kind of refine and build up how we, you know, what forms of behavior we could detect, but we were still fundamentally looking for something we had experience of ourselves, a kind of experience of hearing an instruction, understanding it, and deciding to respond. Um, now, rocks don't give us any evidence of doing that. In fact, rocks don't give us any evidence of any sort of experience that we're familiar with. But I think that once you recognize this relativity to what's familiar, uh, we should recognize that that doesn't necessarily tell us that they're not conscious. It just tells us that if they're conscious, what's going on there is very, very different to anything we're familiar with. Um, but I think once you're once you recognize that there's room for for that distinction, um, panpsychism becomes much more attractive um, because what panpsychism is committed to is not that they're conscious in a way that is familiar to us. It's that they're conscious in a way that differs from us only structurally and only by degree. Because as I said earlier, you know, that, that seems to be what natural science reveals, that you know, a rock and our human brain, very, very different, but the differences are all about structure and they're all different sort of degree. Um, there's no deep discontinuity. There's no difference in the fundamental ingredients. It's just how it's arranged. And so likewise, uh, you know, I think of panpsychism as essentially the idea that there's something going on in a rock that differs only structurally and only by degree from what's going on inside me. This this thing I call consciousness that I'm immediately in touch with that I don't have to infer from external observations. Um, and you know, I, I think there's you know the word consciousness is used in lots of ways, um, and so people will often. You might not want to call what the rock has consciousness. You might want to say, well, it's not unified enough to be consciousness, or it's not reflective enough to be consciousness, or it doesn't have any kind of uh, cognitive accessibility. It doesn't have what philosophers often call access consciousness. Um, and I'm, I'm basically happy to go along with whatever terminological choices people want to make. I, as long as we can ac accept still that there's something that differs only by degree from what I call phenomenal consciousness in myself, from that kind of raw feeliness, that, that irreducible subjectivity. Um, and so that's, that's what kind of what I see panpsychism as being. It's the combination of being a realist about this thing I call consciousness. In particular, it's, it's kind of raw subjectivity, um, while also trying to accommodate the, the scientific uh, evidence that suggests the deep unity and continuity uh, in the universe. Um, since we started late, I'm not sure if I have much more time. Um, maybe I'll say something for about five minutes, just quickly about the combination problem. Because okay. um, that's that's an objection that's often brought up to panpsychism. Um, and I really wish that I had a concise kind of summary of my response to it. I don't in part because I think it's it's not really a single problem. I think it's a, it's a cluster of interrelated difficulties, some of which focus on you know, what it is to be a subject, some of which focus on the unity of consciousness, some of which focus on the, the qualities or the structure of consciousness. I've often had this experience where you know, someone will say that they're very worried about the combination problem, but then it turns out that what they see as the real problem is very different from what someone else had been saying it was. Um, but I think I, I do want to stress, and Philip kind of mentioned this about uh, you know what I try to do in my book. I don't think this is a uniquely panpsychic problem. Panpsychism implies that mental combination is very very widespread. That there's a lot of it. That you know each of us is a kind of group mind uh, composed of all the, the the consciousness associated with uh, ganglia and neurons and perhaps you know, neurotransmitter molecules and those are in turn combinations of yet simpler uh, minds associated with fundamental particles. 
But just being a not uh, not a panpsychist doesn't mean that you don't uh, need to make sense of mental combinations. Um, you know, we we have just to give a simple example, we have pretty good evidence that both of the cerebral hemispheres are independently capable of supporting a stream of consciousness, at least in conjunction with uh, the brainstem and subcortical uh, structures. Um, and so that, you know, seems to suggest at least the possibility that there are, you know, that they're both active at once in everyday life, they've both got some kind of phenomenal consciousness associated with them, which could exist in the absence of the other. And yet each of us, you know, seems to ourselves to be one unified stream. And so, you know, you have to grapple with these questions about how does that one unified stream combine out of two, you know, independent phenomenality associated with each hemisphere. Um, and I, I think, so part of what I think needs to happen here is that even without being a panpsychist, thinking about cases like this should push us to move away from what you might call like the, the Cartesian model of a mind, where minds uh, in the way kind of conceived of by Rene Descartes, famous dualist, are both perfectly integrated internally. You know, their, their parts are all equally and very strongly connected to every other. I mean, not really part, all of their states, all of their processes are deeply integrated. And they're also sharply uh, separated from every other mind. You know, two Cartesian souls cannot directly interact. They can only interact uh, interact indirectly through their bodies. And I think sometimes people are very taken by the combination problem because they they sort of import this model down to the fundamental level and think that there are you know trillions of little Cartesian souls that are only able to interact indirectly. They're each kind of cut off, kind of like uh, Leibnizian monads. In uh, you know, Leibniz was, I think, kind of a good example of something like a, de a Cartesian panpsychist, um, where each mind is a is an independent substance incapable of direct interaction. Um, and I think we should move away from that both to be panpsychists and just to be good scientifically informed philosophers. We should recognize that minds are much more messy than that. They're much more kind of continuous with their surroundings. It's much less of a, a sharp disconnect between the way that, say, my two hemispheres communicate, which ultimately is just, you know, complicated electromagnetic signals, and the way that, you know, one of my hemispheres communicates with one of Francois's hemispheres, which is a different kind of complicated uh, electromagnetic signal. You know, in this instance, it goes a lot further because it's mediated through uh, Wi-Fi connections and so on. But it's it differs only by degree, and I think that should encourage us to think minds are less like separate little, uh, you know, uh, mind pearls is kind of a, a metaphor sometimes used and they're much more like patterns or ripples in an underlying continuous kind of ocean of consciousness um, and I think that on that picture hopefully the, pan uh, the, the combination problem is less intractable um, so I think I've talked for long enough so I'll uh, cede the floor to Francois now Thanks very much Luke Good job. Good job. Sounds all very persuasive to me. Um, Francois, the case for the opposition or yes, the case for uh, the proposition, so, depending. Take it yes, away. It's a pleasure. So first of all, thanks a lot, Luke, for, the, for this beautiful exposition of the view. And I think uh, it was extremely clear. I like that because mine might be less clear. So I'm going to draw on all the clarity that you just added. So I want to thank you for this. Uh, so the view I will present and defend is illusionism about phenomenal consciousness. And in one sentence, it's a view that phenomenal consciousness does not exist, but merely seems to exist. So why would anyone think that in the first place? Well, let's put it that way. On the one hand, consider the physicalist hypothesis. So the hypothesis that everything that exists is nothing over and above the physical. Well, this hypothesis has been extraordinarily successful, as Luke pointed out. I think about the explanatory success of sciences such as modern biology, explaining the marvels of life by appealing ultimately only to physical things, at least arguably. But on the other hand, consider this. In introspection, we seem to discover phenomenal experiences, the existence of which 
apparently creates an issue for physicalism. That is, in introspection, we find phenomenal experiences of pain, of the smell of coffee, of the color blue. We find these mental episodes which seem endowed with this phenomenal feel, this what it's likeness, these subjective qualitative properties. And the problem is that we don't understand how these phenomenal experiences could be nothing over and above the physical, right? This is at the heart of the hard problem of consciousness, of the explanatory gap, of the knowledge argument with Mary and the black and white room that Luke mentioned, but also maybe more generally with a little bit of more historical perspective, I think it's at the heart of what we've called the mind-body problem for the last centuries. So this means that we have a tension, right? On the one hand, we have physicalism, which seems successful and attractive. And on the other hand, we seem to find these phenomenal experiences. Uh, introspection seems to present them to us, and they do not fit in the physicalist picture. So this tension can be handled in many ways. And I think that the big part of philosophy of mind in the last 50 years has been about precisely how to handle it. So I see illusionism as one way to handle the tension. It consists in saying that phenomenal experiences as introspection presents them, do not exist. They just appear to exist. This dissolves the hard problem of consciousness and the explanatory gap, this persisting and reluctant mind-body problem. And for illusionists, the picture that we have to adopt is a picture in which, of course, we have minds. Of course, we are conscious, but not in this particular way, this uniquely phenomenal and feely way that is presented to us in introspection and corresponds to what philosophers call phenomenal consciousness. Phenomenal consciousness is illusory. So, of course, this way of resolving the issue might seem particularly radical or desperate at first. Isn't it throwing the baby out with the bathwater? After all, some might say, the existence of phenomenal experiences seem introspectively obvious, and maybe we should not dismiss them simply because we currently have a hard time integrating them in our physicalist picture of the world. So that's usually what the opponents of illusionism, which we can call realists, say. But my view is that there are no arguments strong enough to justify, to refuse to take the illusionist conception seriously. And I also believe that once we take it seriously, it comes out as the most coherent, elegant, and fertile view on the problem of consciousness, as a view that overall makes the most sense. So now let's try to focus a bit more on arguing for the view. So in my mind, the overall case for illusionism can only be holistic. That means it requires a comparison of this view with other views when it comes, for example, to the capacity to account for the data, for the simplicity, coherence, elegance, and fertility, which means basically the case cannot be made in five minutes, not even five hours. But I think one way to start the case uh, might be to present what I take to be two interlocking considerations which taken together constitute what I take to be a strong reason to at least consider illusionism as a serious contender. So the first consideration, uh, which is in line with what I said earlier, appeals to the success of physicalism and the problematic nature of phenomenal consciousness for physicalism. So basically the idea is that given that phenomenal consciousness is so pro problematic to integrate in the physicalist picture of the world, and given that physicalism has been so extraordinary, extraordinarily and even surprisingly successful so far, we should admit the following. If positing the existence of phenomenal consciousness does not explain our data better than denying it, then we should deny it. So in other words, the idea is that if illusionism and realism explain our data as well, then we should choose illusionism precisely because phenomenal consciousness is so hard to integrate to a more successful view of reality. Now, it's clear that this first consideration only gives us a conditional conclusion. What we should no wonder about is this. Does positing phenomenal consciousness explain our data better than denying it? Well, first, I think that we have good reasons to believe that physical, physiological, behavioral data about humans are not better explained by positing phenomenal consciousness. It's enough to posit non-phenomenal, physically realized, biological, physiological, neural, computational processes. And whether on top of that we accept or deny phenomenal consciousness does not seem to change much to our explanations. And this, for me, is strongly suggested by the fact that none of our best sciences 
seems to use phenomenal experiences as a crucial explanatory posit. Of course, again, many realists could grant this, but they would still claim, at least many of them, that positing phenomenal experiences is necessary to account for one particular sort of data, data which are precisely about phenomenal experiences, data provided by introspection. In other words, I think many of them would answer, it's true that phenomenality is not a very good theoretical posit, but it's not a theoretical posit at all. It's something we know about directly. And thanks to introspection, the existence of phenomenal states is among our data, which means that theories that deny this existence do not account for the data. I take it that it's a standard realist view. Now, the remaining question is, but do we have direct introspective data about phenomenal experiences? And that's where the second consideration kicks in. I think that we have good reasons to believe that we do not have direct introspective data about phenomenal experiences. One way of saying why, which in fact requires more argument, but is by way of a debunking argument. Here's a starting point. It seems that we can explain our introspective judgments and utterances about phenomenal consciousness as well if we deny or if we affirm the existence of phenomenality. Why? Because again, our best explanations of, our, of these introspective judgments and utterances seem to be neural, psychological, computational, biological explanations, which can be indifferently conjoined with the acceptance or the denial of phenomenality. But this would be an extraordinary coincidence if our introspective judgment and utterances did carry data about phenomenal experiences while our explanations of these judgments and utterances are left completely untouched by the denial of phenomenal consciousness. I'm not saying that it's literally impossible, but it would still be an extraordinary co coincidence. All right, the idea is that if introspective judgments and utterances really do carry data about phenomenal consciousness, then we should expect phenomenal consciousness to play a crucial role in bringing about these judgments and utterances. And this in turn implies that we should expect our explanation of these utterances and judgments, if not to require positing phenomenality, but at least to be damaged by denials of phenomenality. But they do not seem to be so. So for me, the reasonable conclusion is that we do not have direct introspective data about phenomenal experiences, which given our previous conditional conclusion means that we should accept illusionisms. So these two interlocking considerations taken together seem to me to provide a good start for an argument for the view. So just for a little point of history of recent philosophies, the first point which insists on the problematic nature of phenomenality has been stressed, for instance, by Dan Dennett, uh, see, for instance, his book, Consciousness Explained, but also Keith Frankish in his uh, article, uh, Illusionism as a Theory of Consciousness, Keith was just up there in my screen. But the second consideration, as surprising as it seems, has been mostly emphasized by David Chalmers, who is a staunch defender of realism regarding phenomenal consciousness, much closer to Luke and Philip than to Keith and me. And see, for instance, his recent article on the meta problem of consciousness, where he develops a debunking argument for illusionism, the conclusion of which he does not endorse in the end, but of which he admits that he puts serious pressure on realist views of consciousness. So, of course, these two interlock interlocking considerations are just a starting point. They cannot be the last word here. For instance, many will refuse to even consider illusionism seriously as a view worth arguing for. Um, and to continue the conversation a bit, I will now examine a few reasons why people might want to dismiss illusionism and like, quickly say a few words about why they are not good reasons. So a classic standard objection that we very, very often hear is that some people just claim that illusionism is contradictory because phenomenal experiences cannot seem to exist without existing. I think it is the most common objection to the view, but I also think that it is not so hard to answer it. To respond to this objection, one method is to distinguish between different senses of seem. There is a sense of seems that is a phenomenal sense where basically seems to exist means being phenomenally presented as existing. And of course, this sense of seems would make illusionism contradictory and incoherent. However, there are other sense of seem, for instance, functional senses, say senses of seems such as X seems to exist means 
we are strongly disposed to believe that X exists or, or something of the kind. And in these senses of seem illusionism is absolutely not incoherent. And that's uh, using these senses of seems that we should read illusionism in my mind. Second, some people can say that illusionism, yes, might be coherent, but at the end it is nothing but a skeptical hypothesis that we should not take seriously. <clears throat> the same way we don't take seriously the hypothesis that the world was magically created five minutes ago. Although, of course, this hypothesis is compatible with the data I currently have. So here I strongly disagree. I think that illusionism is not only compatible with the data. As I try to show, of course, to cursorily, it's the simplest, most natural account of the data. The hypothesis that the world was created five minutes ago, on the other hand, like other skeptical hypotheses, is not. For instance, we can explain the present in a way that is much simpler and elegant if we suppose that the past was more or less the way we think it was. Third, some people say that illusionism denies the obvious and that for this reason, it should not be taken seriously. So one way to avoid this objection is to state that phenomenal experiences maybe are not so obvious after all. Maybe they seem to exist merely because we have adopted some bad theories in the first place. <coughs> and I think that Keith and that Dennett are sometimes attracted to this sort of line. This arguably leads to a variety of illusionism where what we deny is only phenomenal consciousness understood as a theoretical posit, as a product of bad philosophy and bad reasoning, and not as a seemingly obvious pre-theoretical entity. I think that this might be a place where Keith and I tend to differ. I think I'm rather happy to grant that there is a sense in which illusionism denies something <coughs> that seems extremely obvious, even pre-theoretically something whose appearance does not depend on the adoption of any theory, but is simply the result of the functioning of introspection understood as the non-theoretical process. But in my mind, it's not because introspection is pre-theoretical that it is infallible, or that we should never overturn its verdicts. On the contrary, I think that the last centuries have seen many, many seemingly obvious pre-theoretical beliefs being overturned by a combination of science and philosophical reasoning. Of course, we can debate on whether or not we should do this for phenomenal consciousness. But, this but its seemingly obvious nature, which I recognize, cannot be the last word of this debate. <coughs> I don't have COVID, but I have a bad cough, which <clears throat> is also making things difficult. So fourth, some, some people sometimes make illusionism sound much more implausible than it is. Illusionists do not deny that there are lots of differences, for example, between a state of dreamless sleep and a state of wakefulness, or between a conscious and an unconscious perception. Simply, this difference is not to be cashed out in terms of what is phenomenally experienced in these cases. It has to be cashed out in a non-phenomenal way, for instance, in terms of access consciousness, which refers to the global availability of representations, or higher order consciousness, which refers to the obtaining of a higher order meta representation of first order states. Fifth, some people sometimes say that, well, illusionism is just a provocative way of presenting physicalism. I see that it goes further than that because in my mind, it's the only physicalist option which fully and unambiguously gets rid of the hard problem and the explanatory gap. There are also some physicalists who are sympathetic to the spirit of illusionism, but simply prefer softer presentations of the view. They'd rather say, for instance, that phenomenal consciousness exists, but it's different from what it seems to be. So that's the sort of view that Keith called weak illusionism. And I have no problems with such formulation when there are nothing but semantic variations on the standard strong illusionism I defend. However, I have problems with this formulation if they pretend to be more than that, because I'm, I'm afraid that they will face the hard problem of consciousness again. And I also have problems with these formulations even if they are understood as mere semantic variations on strong illusionism, if they pretend to give a view that is more plausible than strong illusionism. Why? Well, because as a view resulting from such semantic variations is supposed to be substantively identical to strong illusionism, it should not be more plausible than strong illusionism. Otherwise, this means that a misunderstanding has taken place. Finally, some people seem to think that the case for illusionism depends on the antecedent acceptance of physicalism. 
This might even have seemed the case in my previous argument. But, these people would claim, physicalism is a very ambitious metaphysical thesis, which reflects a very optimistic conception of our powers of knowledge, and maybe we should not bet on its ultimate truth. Hence, they say, the case for illusionism crumbles. <clears throat> I think that this is a misunderstanding. I don't think that the illusionist needs to first claim that physicalism is true to then conclude to illusionism. What they need to do is simply to stress that physicalism, because it is so successful, should only be judged false about a particular case if we have a very good reason to do so. For example, if we can really account better for the data we have by doing so. And we can perfectly defend this while accepting that physicalism might be false in the end. So, of course, <coughs> illusionists have still a lot of work to do. For instance, must explain, they must explain why we are subjected to the illusion of phenomenal consciousness. Uh, Keith calls this problem the illusion problem. Here's one aspect of this problem that has interested me a lot in the last years. Not only are we subjected to the illusion of phenomenal consciousness, but this illusion seems much stronger than other illusions. Most people fin find illusionism about phenomenal consciousness hard to believe and even sometimes hard to entertain in the sense that the idea just does not seem to make sense to them. And no such difficulty usually seems to attend other illusions. So this might be a point where Keith and I differ again, although I'm not sure about this. Uh, I would be curious to know what Keith has to say, but I suspect that I'm more inclined than him to grant that illusionism is extremely hard to believe and even to conceive of such. And I'm also more inclined to think that this unique counterintuitive nature is at the heart of the explanandum of the illusion problem. But in my mind, the fact that the illusion of phenomenal consciousness is so much harder to accept and even to envision than other illusions suggests that it deserves a special treatment. I've hypothesized, for instance, in past work, that a solution might lie in the intertwining between phenomenal introspection and evidential cognition. Roughly, the idea is that our phenomenal introspection is laden by our naive epistemology, so that we introspect phenomenal states as states with which we stand in an intimate epistemic relation, with which we are acquainted, so to speak. And this, in turn, could make it extremely hard to intuitively grasp that these states are illusory, that they do not exist, but merely seem to exist. Another thing that illusionists must do is explore the consequences of their view for other domains. One fascinating case concerns ethics. Phenomenal states, and particularly the valenced ones, such as pain and pleasure, joy and sorrow, are often thought to constitute a uniquely important source of value in our lives. Maybe for this reason, by the way, sentience, the capacity to enter such states, is often seen as a hallmark of moral status. Illusionists, who claim that there are no phenomenal states, and so in some reading that there is no sentience, must face up to the ethical consequences of their views. So while I believe that there are lots of ways to think about the ethical consequences, I think I disagree here with Keith, who thinks that illusionism does not change anything when it comes to ethics. So I believe that it does change things. In my mind, illusionist views which try to save exactly the same distribution of value and moral status as sentientist ethics might be coherent, but they are not well justified. And in general, I think that ethical views that do not give a uniquely important role to states such as pain and pleasure in grounding value tend to fit better with illusionism than views that do. So personally, and although it does not at all strictly from my illusionism, I'm increasingly attracted to some sort of perfectionist Aristotelian view of ethics, where the main ground of value is excellent deployment of our theoretical and practical capacities, and where the role of states such as pleasure and pain is less than often thought, although it's not nothing. So in conclusion, I can say a few words maybe about the relation between illusionism, the view that I defended, and panpsychism, which is the other view to be debated today. So on the one hand, it's clear that they are as opposed as they can be. Right. Panpsychism sees phenomenality everywhere, illusionism nowhere. Panpsychism often relies explicitly or implicitly on the view that we have some introspective, direct, special relation to our phenomenal experiences, something like acquaintance, while illusionism relies on denouncing such an idea. Of course, on the other hand, the views have some things in common. 
they both oppose in some respect what can be described as the mainstream, even maybe the folk view of the mind. They both seem radical and they both elicit incredulous stares. And what I appreciate when I discuss with pan psychists such as Philip and Luke is their capacity to question received views, endure these frequent incredulous stares and strive for coherence. However, while they do show boldness in challenging some common intuitions about the distribution of phenomenal consciousness, I regret that they shy away from questioning the capacity of introspection to inform us about some fundamental aspects of reality. If they did question introspection further, they might come to see illusionism as an attractive option, and I for sure would welcome them with open arms. Excellent. Thank wow. you. <clears throat> Thanks. Are you making me change my mind now? <laughs> um, I'm almost convinced. Okay, should we um, maybe we be a bit stricter with timings now? So the next option is I'm going to invite Luke. Oh, no, sorry, Francois to cross-examine Luke for 10 minutes. I'm going to do 10-minute timer here. And then, uh, and then maybe Keith can invite uh, Luke to cross-examine Francois. <coughs> I mean, I, so, I can do it without being invited, I suspect. No, no, look, this is, this is a formal debate. You have to be invited and you have to wear a special hat. Oh. People have been saying that the clip that's been going around of the House of Commons 20 years ago where you had to wear a top hat to ask a question. Um, check it out. Um, incredible. The role of tradition. Okay, so which way around are we doing it? Uh, yeah, Francois, from when the timer starts, don't start yet. From when the timer starts, you have 10 minutes to cross-examine Luke on the subject of, well, it could be any subject, but I recommend on the subject of panpsychism. Go. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so I have lots of questions for Luke. Some are born from earlier considerations. Some come from what you just said. Well, let's start with some more general question, a little bit on the theme of what I said at the end of my presentation. So would you say that you are certain that introspection accurately informs you about the nature of your internal state, um, in that case, a phenomenal state? And if you're not certain of this, does it affect your credence in panpsychism? And if you are certain of this, don't you feel the pressure of, let's say, the success of naturalistic approaches to introspection right, as a representational capacity explained computationally as a process of evolution by natural selection, etc.? So that's my first question. So for me, the question of whether I'm certain uh, that I that introspection uh, tells tells me enough about consciousness for me to rule out illusionism, at least, um, is a lot like the question of whether I'm certain that one plus one equals two. Um, you know, if I just make the first order <coughs> investigation of, you know, can I conceive of it being different? How how compelling or how you know, what, what kind of credence level does does the intuitive obviousness of one plus one being two have? I mean, I, I can't imagine anything that I'm more certain of. It seems like I should rate it 100%. It's not like, you know, I have some evidence and given that evidence, I can say, well, there's some percentage <clears throat> chance that two plus two really is, sorry, that one plus one really is two. It's just, it seems like it's just built into the, the concepts. Um, but of course I could be wrong. Like when I step back and I take a meta, you know, second order view, any reasoning I, could, I do, I could be wrong about. You know, I could be wrong uh, in, in thinking that I'm currently saying I could be wrong about anything. I might be subject to some really weird cognitive illusion where I don't even know what I'm saying to you right now. Um, and so I, I do try to, you know, make space for the possibility of, of illusionism, for instance, being maybe the right theory in the end. Like, I, have, I can't put any limits on how deeply wrong I could be. But when I'm doing, you know, theoretical work, when I'm trying to understand the world, I think, you know, I have to work with a, a basic level of, of trust in my cognitive capacities. Um, and, you know, nothing is, nothing is more obvious to me than that I'm having experiences, that, they, that they're like something, that they have uh, a feel to them. Um, you know, but I mean, I, 
we can call that introspection, although I think it's important to note this isn't something I just do every now and again when I stop and think about my experiences. There's, I have a, I'm aware of them perpetually in a, a kind of less reflective way. Um, so yeah, I, I would say I, I think it's possible illusionism is true just as I think it's possible that I didn't think the thing I think I just thought. Like anything is possible, even illusionism. Okay, thanks. So I think I'm going to, in some sense, continue to be this question, but under a more precise angle, because one of the things that, again, for me, makes a good case for illusionism is the sort of pressure against um, the, let's say, accurate, accurate nature of introspective verdicts that I get from debunking arguments, right? The idea is that, well, uh, it seems that we can explain our introspective utterances and judgments without at all mentioning phenomenality and maybe even while denying phenomenality. Wouldn't it be a strange coincidence that even though uh, we can make these explanations, our introspective utterances and judgments still uh, happen to accurately track phenomenality and also uh, happen to accurately track a fundamental nature of reality? Um, so are you, sens are you, let's say, sensible to this sort of coincidence consideration? Does that worry you or yeah. not? Yeah, so I mean, I... I, I do I do think there's something interestingly challenging in how does one account for introspection in particular how does one account for the way that it seems to produce this this uh, sense of, of being in touch with a, a phenomenal feel beyond the more obviously useful things like you know telling you when your hand has been hit by a hammer telling you when you can see something edible in front of you you know it's, a, it's fairly easy to explain why it would tell you those things. Um, I mean, I think the the problem is kind of symmetrical between us, uh, though. Like, you've got the illusion problem. Why? Do, why and how does uh, introspection seem to tell us something completely beyond all of these useful things um, that is nevertheless completely false? Um, and I have what you kind of call the the coincidence problem. Uh, why does it tell us this if? a non-conscious system could give at least the same reports. Now, I will say, I I think it's a, a little misleading one way you characterized <clears throat> this problem in your in your, your initial talk just now um, was a saying that consciousness plays no crucial role. I don't think that's, that's right. I think that, you know, every step of the way uh, in you know, the, the neural processes that lead to me giving an introspective report What's doing the work is all different configurations of consciousness. Because I think that you know, it's all consciousness. It's not like we have the purely physical brain and then we have to ask what's left over for consciousness to do. So I would express the, the point that you're making as, uh, rather as the point that, you know, in a world that's very different from ours, there could be a system that is not made of consciousness, but is made of something else, something that, <laughs> Uh, I know that Philip likes to quote the Stephen Hawking phrase, but what breathes fire into the equations? You know, we have all of these equations given to us by physics that tell us how systems behave and how they will appear and how they'll affect other systems. Um, and, but then that doesn't quite tell us what it actually is in itself. And I think that in our universe, it's consciousness. In another universe, it would be something else. But that something else would still, I think, go beyond... A structural description that that physics might give it'd still be something you know some sort of intrinsic nature something that would go beyond a purely structural description and so i don't actually think it's super problematic for me to say uh you know even that non-conscious system would give reports saying oh there's something here that isn't fully accounted for by a purely objective purely structural purely physical description i think it would be referring to something deeply alien to us, not to, not to consciousness. Um, but I think panpsychism actually, like, because it can give that sort of response, because it has consciousness doing all the work that's done by physical systems, it's actually better able to respond to this kind of challenge than, uh, you know, dualist views or views that are kind of uh, allow for purely non-conscious stuff to do some of the work in our world and then have to find a role for consciousness. Um, although I, as I say, introspection is is perplexing for everyone so i don't think this is a complete story about how it works um but i i and i do see that there's there's room to probe and 
some more work that needs to be done here. Uh, yeah, of course, we could discuss that more. But I have a last question, which is some sort of an internal question that came to my mind while listening to you. And you say in your presentation that, well, if rocks are conscious, then they are conscious in a way that is maybe radically different from ours. Mm -hmm. But then I'm just having a worry, like, how do you know that it makes sense to even say that they are phenomenally conscious? You say, well, what we can say is that what they have is something that differs from our own consciousness only by degree. Mm -hmm. But how do we know that we have a good grasp, even a vague good mm -hmm. grasp, of the sort of degrees that are relevant here? For example, how do we rule out the possibility that what you call feeliness is actually just one degree on the scale where other points on the scale have nothing like feeliness at all? How can mm -hmm. we even have a vague idea of that? Yeah, good. So, I mean, I, to, again, to an extent, I, I want to agree that there's a, a lot of uncertainty here. So, so a good example of this um, is if you look at uh, Spinoza and Schopenhauer, two historical panpsychists, at least as I interpret them, um, they they give very different views about what the the kind of most fundamental element of of experience of, of the mind is and that leads them to attribute very different things to the the material world more broadly so spinoza is this very kind of cognitivist rationalist philosopher um where he essentially he reduces will <coughs> to cognition uh and so the sense in which he's a panpsychist is roughly that everything has some sort of idea associated with it everything is as he puts it uh, I, an idea in the mind of nature. Um, whereas Schopenhauer seems to think that ideas, thoughts, all that content stuff is relatively superficial. And what's really deep and, and the core of, of, of experience is will. And so he says, you know, everything in the universe is a different manifestation of will. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't think that I have a perfect grasp of, you know, which of those is closer to the truth or if either. Um, I, you know, I, I see this as, as a kind of more direction to pursue, uh, ongoing research than like a settled conclusion. You know, I, I think that whatever rock has is something that differs only by degree from what we have. Um, what are the dimensions of that degree? Um, you know, as best I can tell right now, there doesn't seem to be a difference of degree between some sort of subject of consciousness and, and nothing at all. Um, those appear to be discontinuous with one another. Um, but I, you know, I'd be open to being persuaded. You know, I know that you have Eric Schwitzgable coming on later on this podcast who will talk about, you know, could there be something in between conscious and non-conscious? But my impression is that he precisely doesn't think he can actually say what it would be like. He just thinks we have to accept that there's a kind of bafflingness to it because he thinks consciousness is probably kind of a superficial and, and misleading phenomenon, not not a, a part of a real part of reality on any deep level. So I think if it is part of reality on a deep level, I, I'm going to stick with the fact that I can't really make sense of an intermediate degree. So I know I've gone over time here, I think. I've gone over Francois's time, which makes it even worse. <laughs> OK. Uh, thanks, thanks, Luke, for the, for the answers. Mm. OK. Well, I will try to emulate Philip here and, and, and stick to a time. I've actually got the, uh, the time here. So, uh, Luke, it's uh, <coughs> your opportunity to cross-examine Francois, and I'll, I'll let you know in 10 minutes or up. So go I'll get go. him, Luke. Okay. <laughs> so I guess I want to ask about something where we almost agreed. So you said the hypothesis of physicalism has been incredibly successful. And I said that the natural sciences, which maybe have a kind of methodological commitment to, to a, a kind of unifying monism, have been very successful. But I didn't say physicalism had. Um, because it seems to me that the, you know, what has been successful can be captured uh, pretty well with the kind of structural characterization I gave it. That you know, all the different things in the world are fundamentally the same stuff. They follow the same laws. Their differences are differences of degree. Their differences are structural, um, and that kind of you know captures the sense that like yeah, chemistry turned out to reduce to, to quantum physics. Biology turned out to be largely biochemistry, um, and so on. 
I don't think that you needed physicalism in the, the strong sense to do any of that. In particular, I don't think you needed the idea that the things that physics characterizes are exhaustively characterized by physics, that they don't have a subjective or mental aspect. Indeed, you know, a lot of people in, you know, a lot of leading scientists in the, and philosophers in the 19th century said things that, you know, to our ears sound more like panpsychism than they sound like physicalism. Um, you know, they, they had this kind of parallelist view, well, there's a physical domain and there's a psychic domain and they run in perfect uh, lockstep. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm interested in why you think that the thing that's been successful is a physicalist hypothesis and not something more like a, a naturalist hypothesis that would be compatible with panpsychism. Okay, I think that's a very interesting question. Uh, I, the way I get your suggestion, it's like we're having a debate about what is it that has been so successful and then to what should we give credit for this success? Mm -hmm. And I take it, so maybe I'm misinterpreting what you say, but I have the impression that you might make uh, what in my mind has been successful a little different. Maybe you give some sort of version that um, fits well with panpsychism, mm -hmm. but maybe is not entirely does not entirely capture the historical process because basically it seems to me that you say, well, what has been vindicated or what has been so successful in the last century is an hypoth the hypothesis is that everything is made of the same stuff, more or less. That we're all part of uh, the main, like at the fundamental level, there is just one sort of ingredient in the world. Mm -hmm. And I take it that what has been successful is more precise than that, which is the sort of view that Thales already uh, was defending in the ancient Greek world. Like we're all made of water. It was already... Mm -hmm. uh, a view of the kind, and I think it's a, it has been a very popular view to guard the history of philosophy, mm -hmm. and that it's not specifically vindicated by, or it's not the only thing that is specifically vindicated by recent mm -hmm. scientific success. I think what is specifically vindicated in my mind is most precise than that. How to, how to present it, maybe it would be something like, we can explain complex and apparently irreducible things in a purely structural manner. So it's more than simply saying that we are made of the same stuff, but it's also like structural explanations uh, can, uh, let's say, move, move us forward when we contemplate apparently irreducible things. I think the most successful example would be something like life, uh, mm -hmm. like explaining reproduction, uh, metabolism, these sort of things by appealing in the end only to physically grounded entities. But I think that's also a case to be made for things like cognitive capacities and not even considering here experiences. I think it is a striking success that something as mysterious are, as our ability to perceive our environment, report in it, at least we're not, we're not completely done it, but we are on the right track to do it by appealing only to structural explanations. And I think, of course, like, does it mean that it is exactly the same thing as physicalism? That's a big question. As we all know here, there are tons of ways to interpret physical and physicalism and not all have exactly the same conclusions but at least some some form of method methodological physicalism i think has been vindicated which goes further than just the view that we have we are all made of the same fundamental reality okay good yeah so i, I think it's it's right that we we want to talk about something more specific than you know what Thales and democritus and like the ancient monists were were, were talking about um but i i think that actually really good book on this uh, called Galileo's Error, um, written by a, a philosopher whose name I forget, um, which is that the, the, the kind of foundational thing that, that really set apart the monistic naturalistic approach uh, that we associate with the scientific revolution and that has been heavily vindicated um, is a, a focus on mathematics, the idea that um, Galileo said that something like the book of the universe is written in the language of mathematics. Um, but I, I mean, Philip can probably elaborate about how this involves like a, a demotion or a relocation of the qualitative. Um, you know, Aristotelian physics is very much about like things really have a color in them and modern physics is very much like, no, things are just quantitative mathematical patterns that the brain interprets as colored. Um, but I don't think, and like, the, you know, the, the, there is something, yeah, more specific there, but it doesn't have to contain a commitment to um, like its own radical sufficiency or a claim to exhaustively describe the things that are characterized mathematically. Um, 
I mean, and we can we can probably argue a bit about you know what did different people believe at different times. You know, lots of these people were at least nominally Christian, but I don't think that's been particularly vindicated because I don't think that was playing a role in the explanatory success. And so, likewise, I don't think that uh, the idea of a physical description of a given thing being exhaustive um, was playing a role in the explanatory successes. Uh, but sorry, but I'm not not meant to be telling you my view. I'm meant to be asking you questions. Um, and so I guess, well, one question I have actually is a few times you say, you know, why should, why, why can't people be open to the possibility <coughs> of illusionism? I'm happy to be open to the possibility, you know, if, if other people will be open to the possibility of, of panpsychism, um, as a, methodologically, I, I don't think we're in a position where we should try to settle on a, a view of the mind body problem and kind of then move from there. Uh, I prefer to think we should pursue, you know, multiple schools in tandem. But I'm, I'm wondering what you think of as the right kind of meta methodology for investigating science. Should it be something where illusionists are kind of doing doing their thing, and, you know, no, other physicalists are doing their thing, and other people are doing their thing, or should we be trying to settle matters? Well, that's that's a good question. I think it's a very hard question to answer in the sense that. Basically, I think like the, the basic answer is not very interesting. It's like whatever works. And then, mm -hmm. then it's a bet about what is more likely to work and to move us forward. So mm -hmm. I think that in my mind, it's important that we develop research programs a bit further than simply stating positions and discussing mm -hmm. philosophical arguments. And one of the value of illusionism in my mind, which I did not stress that much, I just mentioned it, is its fertility. I think it does lead to... Mm -hmm interesting perspectives, for example, when it comes to solving the illusion problem. You don't need to be an illusionist to want to explain why we say what we say about consciousness, but it does give, a, let's say, a theoretical importance to this topic and focuses the attention on, on this aspect that is, I think, very relevant. Mm -hmm. And so I'm all in for exploring uh, research programs which might sometimes require some degree of isolation between different research questions. In a, a, Let's say at a personal level, I don't really like that because I do like engaging with people who disagree with me. But in some sense, mm -hmm. it's a personal taste. Now, to what extent does this personal taste and this sort of um, taste for settling questions, including with radical opponents, like to what extent is this um, philosophically fruitful? I think that's a sort of bet that is, I, I, I cannot have a fully justified answer to this question. I think at the end of the day, we have to make bets. And I, but just also to conclude, oh, I see about the oh, I see the meta disagreement on this issue. I think to that to a lot extent, what the standard Kuhnian perspective on paradigm change and paradigm opposition mm -hmm. said can be very relevant to these issues because illusionists and panpsychists or maybe illusionists and strong realists not only disagree about I don't I don't see the screen keys, but I suppose yeah, I'm at the end of the time. Okay, I'm just to conclude in the sentence. I don't only disagree about like <clears throat> says it, but they also disagree about the way of framing the question about the data at their disposal. It's very akin to the sort of opposition that Kuhn described as paradigm oppositions. Mm -hmm. And what Kuhn said is that at the end, we choose a paradigm over another, not because it's better argued for, but better it's it has more promise of success. Mm -hmm. And I think that typically on this um, on this scale, I think that illusionism fares quite well. Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's really helpful. Okay. Excellent. Really, really, really stimulating discussion, guys. So we're moving to the final section of our formal it, debate. Here. This this it, beer is, there, is really helping with my COVID, actually. Go on. Oh, okay. Is, is there a chance we could just take a, a couple minutes? Oh, break? yes. I have a, a cat issue. Um, Absolutely. Be, well, we can off. chat amongst ourselves. Okay. I, I will also go for like two minutes if we have a two minute break. Sure. Oh, is that the alarm saying we're out of time? That was the ten-minute al alarm for um... this. This this beer is really helping with my COVID. I recommend it to anyone who has COVID. Um, really, uh, done wonders actually. I don't know whether that's official medical advice. I don't want to go all Donald Trump, you know, and but um, you know, could be something people might want to look into. Well, <laughs> well, it's, yes, yeah. I guess it's better than trying bleach. Yes, certainly. <laughs> Possibly. Um, yeah. But yeah, so how, when was the last time we did this? October, I think. October 
we were about to interview Donald Hoffman. We were about to go live, and then I got news that my my dad was really ill. So uh, we pulled out the last minute, and then um, and then I was trying to finish my book. So it has been th three months, quarter of a year since we last did that. My goodness. Yes, uh... I've missed I've missed you, Keith. <laughs> did Did you think about me often? I, I uh, all the time. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I I have missed doing these actually. It's it's I I, I do enjoy doing them. Um, we have such interesting guests. Uh, how could one not enjoy that? That's it. We're very lucky. We're very lucky. With Frank Jackson actually next week. I don't. I was just thinking. I don't actually remember seeing him ever on a podcast. Have you? Do you? Have you seen him on on YouTube or? I mean, he's such a huge philosopher, but I've never. Uh, I wonder whether this is the first podcast. He, I don't know. I can't think, be surely, but I I don't recall one. You would have, but, uh, you would have thought so. You would have thought he'd be on stuff, but I I can't really. Francois, have you seen Frank Jackson on on a podcast before? I think so. Uh, no, I not that I can wonder... remember. Maybe remember was he it. ever on uh, Richard Brown's Consciousness Live? Because Richard Brown had a lot of people. So if he was ever on a podcast, yeah. he would have been there. It yeah. might be a good opportunity, Philip, seen. to mention the, the time for that podcast, which is going to be rather different from our usual times, isn't it? Oh, yes. 8 p.m. Wednesday, next Wednesday, 8 p.m. UK time. Of, UK time, yeah, sorry, UK time because he's in Australia. So um we'll uh we'll tweet that one out tomorrow, I think. And um we've also got of course Donald Hoffman that we were about to interview and had to cancel and then Annika Harris as well. We're gonna work out when to interview them at some point, but um no, fine. Yeah. looking forward to that. But okay, we move to our final segment now, and um I'd like to invite uh, Keith to put the top hat on and um, cross-examine oh, the the witness in support of panpsychism, Dr. Luke Roloffs. Take it away. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, I need to time it, don't I? Oh, you put that. Okay, right. Uh, hold on, yeah. don't start yet. Don't start yet. Don't start. I've got to do the timer. Okay. Okay. I'll just start. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Luke. Um. I. I always enjoy um, reading your work and, uh, uh, and thinking about it. Uh, th there's a lot, actually, that we have in common. Um, I, I, I love your anti-Cartesianism. Oh. Um, and uh, yes, I, 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 I find your form of, of panpsychism, um, I, I think it's the most, the form I find most congenial. OK. so. Uh, and I, I really respect the way you, you develop it. The, 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 the clarity and the care and the precision of your work. It's, you know, it's first class. Anyway, okay. So let's, okay. Let's just, let's assume that, um, yeah, okay. That stuff has an intrinsic nature. That there's some stuff that breathes fire into the equations. That uh, it's not just it's not just structural structures. That there's some intrinsic nature that the structures. Describe okay, and that that's shared between us and uh, rocks and atoms and everything. Okay, let's go along with that. It's it, it's the alternatives, but let's let's go with that now. Then I, I want to ask why think we know what this intrinsic nature is? How would how would we know what it was? It seems to me to have some sense of what it was like, we would have to in some way be differentially sensitive to its character. I'm assuming we are just evolved biological organisms. Um, uh, things, uh, to for us to be sensitive some, to something, we have to have some sort of mechanism that's differentially sensitive to the presence or absence of that thing. Okay, so do we have such a mechanism that's differentially sensitive to the intrinsic nature of Reality? I don't think you'd say we do. Do you? No, I mean, I. Um, is it, I mean, yeah. So it's it's not like we can directly compare the experience of having experiences with the experience of not having experiences. Um, I mean, I think what, what I what I would broadly speaking say we have to do is we, you know, we we have lots of different experiences and we can identify the ways that they differ, 
and we can identify the ways that they are the same. And we can, to some extent, supplement this by imaginatively trying to create other experiences and trying to see, like, can we make any sense of the idea of an experience that, you know, had this in common, but not this. Um, and that's, that's not exactly a detection mechanism. But I guess I maybe can I turn this around on you and just ask how you think we are aware of facts about mathematics or logic? Because <laughs> that also seems to be something where we we have pretty pretty plausible seeming truth claims or knowledge claims. It's not that we detected them. It's not that we kind of have a, a number sensor that picked up on the number seven once. Uh, it seems more like there's a, a structural, certain structural features of what's going on in us are available for reflection or something like that. Does I'm, that well, count as the detector by your standards? I, well, what I don't want to say is that we do it by intuiting um, abstract um, objects, forms in, in some platonic realm. That's what I don't want to say, that, because that just sounds like magic. I want to say that whatever it is, whatever process of abstraction is involved, it's the, the, there's got to be some mechanism. Okay, it's, I don't have magical awareness of anything. Is the, the way I, and uh, so you, you see, it's, it seems that you want to, to say two two things that that seem to me don't work, don't really harmonize. One is that our our talk about what our experience is like is is directly sensitive to the very in, to the intrinsic nature of our of, of our of our existence as physical beings that, that there's no mechanism that mediates that sensitivity i don't see how those two things go together i don't see how we can be sensitive to some feature of reality without having some mechanism that mediates that sensitivity and even if there were, and, and if, if 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 we are aware of it in some Im immediate way, what is the I that is sensitive? Uh, is it? I mean, if it's just this biological organism, then again, I come back to my thing that biological organisms are sensitive to things in virtue of having mechanisms that are differentially sensitive to their presence. What is the I that is sensitive to its own intrinsic nature? So. So, so, so one thing I should say, just to preface the rest of my answer, is that I, I do think it's important uh, to, to have like different accounts of what you might call full-fledged introspection, the thing that humans do that leads to reports um, that can you know be used to, to build theories, um, and the kind of Kind of very basic acquaintance that people often think is built into the, the the very nature of consciousness itself, which doesn't always suffice for um, full fledged introspection. So, you know, most people I, I think will take it that, you know, my cat is is conscious, but can't, but isn't aware of itself as being conscious in the way that we are. It can't introspect and it can't talk about experience. You know, even if it could talk about some things. Um, so, but you know, but, but I think it is right to say that the cat has a the cat's relationship to its experiences has a sort of very primitive uh, epistemic character. It's a, it's a sort of awareness that's just not necessarily connected to outputs like like report, memory, understanding. Um, and then I want to to give sort of different stories about those. So, I, I agree with you that there has to be a mechanism for full fledged introspection. There has to be some kind of causal process where information flows and gets integrated um, that goes on in our brains that allows us to to say and think these things. Um, I, oh no, have I already gone over time? No, that's that was me. Bad idea. Um, I'm sure Philip will chip in when 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 the time is up. Uh -huh. is that... um, uh, yeah. So yeah. So there's, there's a mechanism that that allows us to introspect. But, and, and that mechanism, you know, even if we weren't conscious, even if there was no consciousness anywhere, would, would certainly still allow us to, you know, to register various things and produce various reports and, and, and so on. 
Um, but I, what I think a panpsychist should say is that the, it's the combination of these two things, the, the, the human specific cognitive mechanisms with, you know, implemented in a substrate that has a kind of very prim this primitive epistemic self-awareness built into it. Those together are what gets you full-fledged introspection. How exactly they gel is, is I'll admit, um, an interesting question. But I, it's that I primitive study. kind that worries me. Once you start, let's start dismantling, stripping away the, the elements of what you call full-fledged introspection. And I think it's much, much more complex than than we imagine. Um, and they're going to be it's all kinds of levels and layers of self-monitoring involved. Start stripping those away. Uh, uh, now, the idea, I think, the Panzeig's idea is that you could strip them all away and there would still be some sort of awareness there, as in the rock. Yeah. Now, I, I just don't get this. I don't get how the rock can in any way be differentially sensitive to its own intrinsic. Assume it, let's assume it has an intrinsic nature. How can the rock be differentially sensitive to it? And if it can't, in what sense is it aware of it? We seem to be using awareness here in a way that is that is started as rooted in this fully fledged sense that's dependent on introspective mechanisms and self-monitoring and so on. We've stripped away all of those functional aspects and we're left with something that's supposed to be pure awareness, which the rock could have. Mm -hmm. But it seems that we've taken that notion of awareness right out of the context in which it made any sense where we start up and saying the rock's aware of its own intrinsic nature. I, I just can't make any sense of that. Yeah, so when I say that the rock or that you know, any form of consciousness has this built-in awareness. Um, you're right that that's that's going to be a different sense of awareness. Mm -hmm. um, it's not going to be dependent on differential sensitivity of mechanisms. Um, uh, and you know, and and maybe we can kind of split the difference terminologically and say it's not awareness; it's something else. You could call it acquaintance if you don't have you know a role for that term. Um, you know, there's going to be a, a, another question about whether it is properly described as involving representation, um, and that will turn on like what representation means. Um, and and to some extent, this this might boil down to you know I was saying to Francois, you know Spinoza and Schopenhauer seem to disagree about what it is that's right there at the base. Once you strip away the layers, um, and I think. I would hope that panpsychism can be a broad tent, you know, that can include people with different ideas of what's left when you strip away all the layers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those who think that there's something that deserves an epistemic characterization as awareness or something like it, and people who think it, it doesn't. Um, like I think, you know, Sam Coleman, for instance, is a, is a pan qualityist. He thinks that once you strip away, uh, you know, everything, you can strip away structural features of experience and in doing so you'll strip away everything epistemic and what you'll be left with is, is a quality the things that we know but with no knowledge no, no awareness of them um i think that's that's within the uh, the panpsychist broad tent but with a, a kind of a, a different view from my own of, of what is there once we strip away everything structural everything that can vary uh by degree my, my worry now is you see once you've done all this stripping away we're out of time oh, out of time just when i, just when I got time. the killer line philip i was just this this, this. <laughs> well I, sorry I, too late uh, the game the world over. will never know never know what you were going to say <laughs> at all unless unless we ask you <laughs> but i don't yeah. think philip will allow that right now philip no, wants to get no. to francois philip's Philip's the, the boss. Oh, I need to be invited. Keith, you need I to invite, invite you. To... Oh, gosh, invite... Uh, not you, right. Lou. Keith needs oh, to invite okay. me. Uh, you've got to get the form. You've made this CD. unnecessarily complicated, Philip. Okay, so That's I'm now job. going to invite you, Philip, to cross-examine Francois. I'll put and you're going on. to have I, I, 10 minutes. I ran off to find a hat and found my daughter's tiger hat. Excellent. That is perfect. Does it make uh, me look okay. official? It looks awesome. Brilliant. Your ten minutes. Begun. So, Keith said um, you had 
he had a lot of common with Luke. And actually, I think we have stuff in common as well because reading your papers, I mean, what one of the, the ways I've argued against physicalism is by saying we have some insight into the essential nature of consciousness. And you've argued in your illusionism that um, that's that's part of the illusion that we have that sense that of insight into the central nature of consciousness. I think that's exactly the right way to to pin down the, the the intuition there. Also, I really like you. You're not afraid to face up to the radical implications of your view to say that pain does not exist and to explore the ethical implications. Of that. I think that's very cool. Okay, but anyway, let's try and work out why you're wrong. So, so you 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 were trying to pin down Luke on certainty. I mean, certainty seems a a bit of a big ask, but we can talk about degrees of certainty. And, you know, I mean, I guess like many people, it seems to me, you know, the old Cartesian intuition, it seems to me the reality of phenomenal consciousness, the reality of my own pain, for example, is more certain than the external world. Uh, you know, so is more certain than any of the findings of science. So, Given that, if if I'm starting from that epistemological situation, as many people are, that phenomenal consciousness seems more certain than the external world, surely I should I should. Uh, it seems weird to uh, overturn the reality of phenomenal consciousness from certain findings in science. Surely, if all we can do in philosophy is start with what seems most evident. And if the reality of consciousness seems more evident than anything else, shouldn't we take that very seriously? <clears throat> so, yeah, thanks for the, the question, I think, because it helps clarifying a lot. And, uh, and it, it's not just, of course, a question of clarification. I think there is also real disagreement here. But first, clarifications. So first, I would not say any, like in an unambiguous and uh, without any precisification that pain does not exist. I would say pain has various readings. And I grant that there is one reading, uh, which is a rather natural reading, which refers to phenomenal pain, in which sense, uh, in which sense pain does not exist. But I would say, of course, there are other readings of the sentence, such as it's false and pain, of course, exists in functional sense and maybe also in a normative sense, in the sense of stuff happening to creatures that are uh, and stuff that is bad in itself. Now, what you say more deeply is that if we are Cartesian, for instance, but not only Descartes, so that the existence of my pain at a given moment is more certain than anything else and typically more certain than whatever scientists and philosophers might talk about. So it has to be the ground on which I build the rest, or at least it has to be the last uh, thesis that I withdraw, right? Um, the, the ultimate bedrock. So I think I have two things to answer to that. First, I think we need to be really careful when we want to endorse this sort of certainty about what exactly is supposed to be certain here. Is it there is something going on? Is it there is something bad going on? Or is it, as I think it is, a bit more than that? Something like that we cannot maybe easily capture in word, but some sort of determinate substantive idea of a certain phenomenal episode taking place. So I'm all in for granting certainty for there is something going on, or even why not have nothing against something bad is going on. But uh, I think what I'm interrogating is this more substantive certainty um, towards uh, the presence of some like, uh, substantively determinately grasped uh, phenomenal episode. Now, the second thing that I want to say is that I agree with you that there is a sense in which this is our epistemological starting point. Maybe, for instance, because we have a folk epistemology or naive epistemology in which on which we have these very intimate epistemic relations with our phenomenal states. And within this uh, naive epistemology, it makes complete sense to say, well, these things are super certain. I should never or almost never, except in crazy cases, come to dismiss them. And the rest of the world might be an illusion. Now, I also think that it's not because it is our epistemic starting point that it needs to be our epistemic endpoint. So you probably, I mean, I don't know if everyone knows, but there is this nice metaphor which is a Neurath boat, and the idea is that our epistemic enterprise is well figured by the idea that we are at sea on a boat that we have to repair as we move forward. And typically, I can see the Cartesian picture with consciousness at the basis, with like the, the 
primary contact with anything is through consciousness. And then the rest of the world is only known through consciousness so that we can never come to doubt consciousness, but only the rest of, rest of the world. I can see that as one of the pieces of Neurath's boats that maybe we have to get rid of. And typically the extraordinary and in my mind, surprising successes of the like methodological physicalism would be the sort of things that, um, uh, that should justify repairing the boat in this direction. So I don't know, I, I, I suppose I did not convince you, but that's, I see yeah, that's where so we but again, I'm not I, I'm not talking about certainty, and I'm not talking about foundational okay. things you can never give up. I'm just saying it seems more certain than anything about the external world, and so surely on that basis, I should give it a lot of weight. Not doesn't mean I can never throw it out. I'm in my I'm in Yorat's boat. I'm I'm working on it. I'm you know I'm happy to get rid of any planks, but. I surely need very good reason to kick it out. And what reason have you given us? I mean, it seemed to me in your discussion with Luke, you said, oh, it's all about the success of physical science in giving these structural explanations, and they've been very successful. But what were those structural explanations trying to do, other than the case of consciousness? They were trying to, exp I mean, this is a point David Chalmers makes in his Facing Up to the Problem of Consciousness paper, they were trying to explain structure, right? I mean, basically, all scientific questions, apart from questions about consciousness, are trying to explain behavioral structure in a very broad sense of behavior, like how stuff, how systems behave. And we try and explain that with mechanisms, right? So, yeah, it's not surprising that structural explanations work well when we're trying to explain structure, right? But that doesn't give us grounds for thinking that same form of explanation is going to work when it comes to phenomenal consciousness, which when we're trying to explain that, we're not trying to explain some observable stru behavioral structure. We're trying to explain this phenomenon that we seem to have immediate awareness of. So yeah, so nothing certain, nothing unrevisable, but there's something that seems more evident than anything else. And so surely we should give that a lot of weight. And I don't see what your counter argument is. It just seems to be saying structural explanations were good at explaining structure. Okay, I see. So I think uh, two things to answer. First, I'm happy that you grant that it's not a matter of absolute certainty. It's just that we start with, let's say, some strong prima facie um, justification. So it's already good because you're already doing one step in my direction, at least. That's how I see things. And then I want to say, OK, so if we just start by saying, oh, it looks a lot more certain, then we can then start revising, like being good by Asian. We don't start with credence of one. We start with credence of like 0.99, and then we start revising. And typically, one thing that for me should lead to a lot of revision is uh, everything we know about introspection. That seems like a very... Um, ordinary natural phenomenon, very lately developed, continuous with maybe mind reading, maybe perception. And the more we look at it, the less there are reasons to believe that this thing makes us in contact with some fundamental feature of reality more than anything else, right? So that's one first thing. But then I want to address your second point, which is to say we should not uh, take credit as physicalists about uh, the mind, whether illusionist or realist. We should not take credit for the past success of uh, physical explanations because they were already aimed at uh, structural explanations. So, of course, uh, structural explanations are good at explaining structural features, but uh, we should not infer anything about the explanation of non-structural features. So, first, there is one level on which I agree because I don't think we can explain non-structural qualia by structural uh, features explanations. That's why I think we should get rid of qualia. So, in on, on in one sense, I agree. Now. If we look a bit closely at the history, I think it's a bit more complicated than that. I think it's partly reconstruction. The idea is that what uh, like Galileo or, or like theoricians of life were really just trying to explain structural features by appealing to structural explanation. I think we can do that now with distance, but actually what probably was the case is that there was some sort of intermingling of like qualitative representations of phenomenon and probably like structural properties. And the epistemic progress was made by distinguishing the two and focusing on explaining the structural processes and not the qualitative. And of course, our disagreement is, was Galileo's mistake to ignore the qualitative features and, 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 like, and uh, 
repatriate them in the mine or was it to just conserve them at all? And of course, I suppose I would be in the second camp. Uh, but um, I think we are over in terms of time. Thanks yes. a lot for your question. Very interesting. Back you. on that, Philip, I'm afraid. Um, uh, we are indeed uh, out of time. So what what happens now? Um, Philip, what so, is the next step? Well, we've heard all the arguments. I think that's all the arguments you're going to get on this subject. Anything published in journals from this point onwards is probably worthless. You might as well burn them. We've heard all the arguments we need to hear. So it's time to decide which is the correct view, panpsychism or illusionism, because obviously they are the only two options. So to decide this, we're going to do a Twitter poll. Uh, uh, I did it last year, I think, so Keith's going to do it this year. Okay. I, I have one ready. So, I, I, this so, is, I assume we'll, only the, the people who are watching this will vote, So, um, which is a small number. How well, long do you want it to run the, for? That's the only people that matter. So, How uh, long do you want 10, to minutes. For? 10, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Shall right. I time it or should you time it? I've set it to run for 10 minutes and I'm posting it. Oh, right. It. That's a clever way of doing it. I'm posting it oh, so, uh, right now. So, if, if you are still listening, there are. There, uh, then you can vote in that to help decide this crucial philosophical question for all time. And while we're waiting for that, we can uh, take some questions. So if anyone yeah. wants to put a question in the... Unfortunately, uh, YouTube's a, a couple of seconds behind us, so it might take a second for the, the questions to come through. But uh, if you want to just pose a question in the chat. So how did you find the discussion, Luke and Francois, while we're waiting for the... Uh, have you, what, what have you changed your mind on? I, I'm, I, I think changing my mind will be probably a slower process. Um, I, ha I have lingering questions that I want to ask, but I, I'll wait for the comments to come in. Um, I uh, enjoyed the conversation a lot, of course. I think that I did not really change my mind, but there is one point where uh, actually I thought maybe panpsychism, I would find panpsychism slightly more attractive if... Uh, I don't know if you remember, when, when I asked you the question, Luke, about how do we know that the rock is phenomenally conscious and how do we know that even if we assume that whatever it has, it comes, something that comes with degrees with our own form of consciousness, it could be that our own idea of what this feelingness is uh, actually does not capture the whole space of variation, but is one degree on the scale and then it's one degree on the scale. Then I thought, well, maybe there would be some sort of other version of panpsychism that conserves your basic view, which is whatever the rock has is in continuity. It's a matter of degree, whether like it, there is a continuity of degree with my own consciousness. But I don't say that it's consciousness because I have no idea what it is. So the, the view would really just be what is fundamental is something that is continuous with, like, yeah, as, 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 a, as a relation of degree with my own consciousness. And I find that I don't know if the view has more chances to be true. But maybe at least it would uh, avoid some incredulous stares. I don't, I don't know if you would think that the view is substantively different from panpsychism. I think that it's a bit different because we, we suspend the application of our concept of phenomenality. We just say, mm -hmm. we use the concept and then we say, well, whatever just changes in degree on this basis. And that's something that the rock, that's a, like, we can know that the rock has that. So I don't know, what do you think? I think I would be more attracted by that if I had to be some sort of panpsychism, if I had to drop illusionism. I mean, that that sounds like uh, what I think is sometimes called pan protopsychism, which is the idea that everything has <clears throat> proto phenomenal properties, where that's kind of a placeholder, meaning we have no idea what they are, but they somehow explain consciousness. And and kind of part of the view is is the the acceptance of the hard problem, the acceptance that you know, physical properties as described by physics, we know what we mean by talking about them, but they don't explain consciousness, but that this other unknown stuff does. And that is, uh, I mean, that, that does shade kind of into what's sometimes called like non-standard sorts of physicalism, um, partly turning on just like terminological questions about what gets called the physical. Um, I think Daniel Stoljar, for instance, will say something like, you know, everything is just explained by the physical, 
but the physical is is, a, is less transparent to you know physical okay. description than we tend to think. Like there's a lot more to physics for us to, to figure out. Um, okay. We... Up... No, no, sorry, sorry. Finish your point, Luke. Sorry. Uh, yeah, it might end up depending on like where how we forecast what future physics might look like while still being physics. Um, but yeah, anyway. Okay, so pictures. we got a couple of questions. Uh, trans so two, two questions for Luke first. Transcendent, transcend two very similar questions, so I'll just read them both together. Transcendental deduction says, Luke, what do you see the ethical implications stroke benefits of your view, view versus the illusionist view? And Richard asks a similar question. What practical significance does panpsychism add to our worldview, or is it like a religious belief with, with ethical consequences? Ah, okay. So both about the practical implications. Good, good. So, um, so people, you know, people have, have posed this to me sometimes as kind of a, a, a gotcha almost, because um, they'll say, "Look, uh, you're you're a vegan because you think that animals deserve not to be eaten," and usually people say that's because animals are conscious. But hey, if plants are conscious too, then isn't there a, a kind of a an, doesn't that undermine uh, veganism? And like in fact, it's part of the issue is that just raising animals for food requires more plants to get eaten by the animals. But setting that aside, um, I think that panpsychism is best combined with the view sometimes called like narrow sentientism or, or, or the version that says it's not just consciousness per se that gives a being rights and moral status. It's a particular kind of consciousness. It's whether it has something like pleasure and suffering, desire, I mean, whether it can value things as a kind of integrated whole. Um, and I think that that probably is, is widespread in animals, but absent in plants, although there's a lot of uncertainty there. Um, what about like the rest of the world, you know, the inanimate things that, that maybe are conscious, but in, not in this way that gives them moral status? I think panpsychism might imply something like you know, they, it's good that they exist, or there's something to, to feel a kind of generic respect to, even if there aren't interests that make specific moral demands on us. So I think it might contribute to a sense of kinship with maybe wonder at the world, although I don't think that physicalists are necessarily unable to say the same. Thank you, Wish. We have a couple of questions for Francois. Uh, so, um, I've lost it now. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, okay, Nick Dine said, still don't understand what illusionists think about consciousness. Is it a debate about content? And then Vincent Cheap said, illusionists seem to assume that third person perspective science observation, etc., is valid, but that actual first-person perspective does not exist. How is this logically coherent? So what are, what are you talking about? What, what is, yeah, anyway, what do you think about um, that? Yeah, so I'm not sure I understand the first question. Like, is it a question about content? I take it that maybe what the person is asking is whether we're having a verbal dispute in the sense that uh, we, in fact, agree about the facts, but we are simply using words differently. And uh, I know that it's often a fear in philosophy that, in fact, people are just talking past each other because, in fact, if they were using the word in the same manner, then they would uh, agree and, 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 and utter the same statements. So I don't think that this is a verbal dispute. Uh, otherwise, I would not engage in it in this way. So my view is that we can actually sort of try to fix the meaning of what we're talking about, for instance, by uh, deferring to some things that introspection grasps and then the debate can really be is this thing that appears introspectively to exist in this in these situations maybe helped with some theoretical prompting but maybe not in my view not necessarily then does this thing exist and then i take it that this is a substantive question uh, i hope so at least now the second question is do illusionists deny the first person perspective so i would say as always the answer is always a distinction uh, so there is a sense in which, of course, illusionists do not deny the first person perspective in the sense that uh, individuals represent the world from a certain perspective, like 
that can be elaborated, I don't know, indexically, for instance, in terms of uh, also in terms of self-representation. Like there are many, many dimensions of a first-person perspective that illusionists can't completely accept. But then what I also think is that in the way we represent ourselves, in one of the processes of self-representation in which we enter is this illusory phenomenal introspection by which we misrepresent what we are, which states we enter in, and what our first-person perspective consists in. So basically, my answer would be, yes, of course, the first-person perspective is real. Uh, maybe it can be accurately described, at least to some extent, at the, from the third-person perspective. Maybe not for something. For example, indexical statements are uh, widely known to be only thinkable from a certain perspective. But we also have an illusory conception of what some aspect of us of our first person perspective consists in. We see ourselves as these like subjects of experience that are in these very intimate epistemic relations to their experiences. And yes, I'm denying that. So I, I, I suppose it does not really fully assuage the worry, but that's the direction I would take. Um, do we, do we uh, there are some more questions upon psychism? Should we, should we go for those? Uh, a, a Raybold says, is the combination problem not an issue of structure? Uh, Anne Katharina Strasse says, do panpsychists have the hope that they will eventually be able to generate a hypothesis of what it means for stones to be conscious? Tom Clark says, what would count as observational evidence of panpsychism is any needed on your view? Uh, okay, so let me maybe take those in reverse order. Um, I, I mean, the, the, the way I see it, like the basic facts of consciousness are that you, you observe it in your own case and you have to infer it uh, in other cases. Um, so I don't think there are going to be direct uh, observations that kind of establish, uh, you know, that any given thing outside me is, is conscious. Um, I think the observations that support, you know, what I keep calling like the unity of nature and Francois insists on calling physicalism, I think those are in a way like the observations that for me establish panpsychism. You know, I don't think there's anything incoherent in a Cartesian dualist world where there's each of us has a, a special uh, immaterial thing that behaves very differently from the rest of the world. So I guess I think the observations are there and they've already come in. But they, they're not going to distinguish between physicalism and panpsychism. They'll just distinguish both of those from more traditional dualistic views. Um, should I keep going for the other? Uh, remind me of the other two questions? Or I, we can yield to other questions now. I don't... It, is the combination problem just about structure? Do you hope you'll one day have a, explain what, what, what it means for stones to be conscious? So maybe, I don't know, maybe what the character of an experience of a stone is. Do, yeah. do we know, will we ever understand what it's like to be a stone? Um, so there, there's, a, there's a few questions there. So I, I, in my book, I offer the very beginnings of a hypothesis, um, which is that a uh, stone experience might be something like what you would get if you took all of our experience and put it kind of in a blender. Um, that is, you, in place of the, uh, of our experience of, phenomenal contrast where we can separate out different elements of our experience and be like, oh, this is blue, this is red, this hurts, this feels good. Um, those would all kind of be merged into like a single quality um, that reflects like the different ways that they felt, but, but combines them all in this undifferentiated way. And I think that because I, I think that's the best model of why we, like how we have so many different qualities of experience even though the fundamental physical ingredients in us are relatively few in number. Like there's just basically a few different sorts of particle, you know, with a few different properties. Um, and so <clears throat> part of the combination problem has been, well, how do you generate diverse, you know, all the different colors and tastes and smells that we experience out of that? Um, and, and maybe to, to link that to the question of, is, is the combination problem just about structure? In a way, I think it's yeah, it's it's about structure, but it's also about how structure interacts with qualities. Um, it's about, for instance, the idea that I just outlined that, um, that different experiences can be 
combined can be experienced together in a way that doesn't involve their structure being manifest to the composite subject, but rather man it manifests as a, a blended quality. So that, that's that's maybe part of what I would say there. Obviously, there's we're a long way from being able to to really refine that with any confidence, but maybe maybe we'll have stone neuroscience in a century's time. Brilliant. Not all panpsychists think stones are conscious. By the way, I don't think stones are conscious. You think, yeah. uh, you, you think the things that the a panpsychist thinks the fundamental things are conscious, but needn't think <coughs> everything at the macro level is conscious. In any case, final question to Francois. Great question here from Jakub uh, Mihalik, who's a great philosopher. You should check out. I wonder if illusionists think there are any first-person or stroke subjective data for a theory of stroke about consciousness to account for, or are there only third-person stroke into subjectively accessible data? So what is the data for a science of consciousness? Is it, is it For an illusionist, is it all third-personal, or are there some first-personal data as well? Great question. Yeah, so, so the answer that I'm inclined to give is, so first, again, I'm, as I was saying earlier, I'm not denying that there is a first-person perspective, but now here the question is different. The question is, is there some specific first-person data that um, we have to explain in our theories or are all data to be explained, data that can be um, accessed, at least in principle, from the third person perspective. If that the way the question is put, then I'm inclined to go with saying, yes, I think that all the data that has to be explained is maybe in principle, at least, um, accessible from the third person perspective. Now, I think, of course, as often with philosophical question, I would maybe have to know what Jakub had in mind exactly when he asked the question. And maybe if I knew more about what he had in mind, I would answer differently, but at least on the basis of this formulation, that would be my answer. And uh, I will probably see Jakub uh, very soon. So we'll, we'll discuss that. Brilliant. Professor Frankish, do we have the results? Do we have the final oh, answer? We do. The results are in. This is just like election night. Now, uh, Philip, this is definitive, isn't it? Um, oh, you are absolutely, you are absolutely. absolutely this sure is the this is final definitive. statement on the matter. The final statement on the matter. This, this is the, okay. No, con you're, gonna you're not going to. You're not going to say. Roll. You're not going to say it was stolen. You're not going to give a press no, conference outside a gardening on. center. Come on. Okay. Here are the results. There are three I options. Think I know this is going to go. There was three. There was there are three options. One was it was a draw. Thirty point four percent chose that option. Interesting. Now there is the, the panpsychists one. Thirty point four percent chose that option. The other is that the illusionists one, and thirty nine point one percent of respondents chose that option. It has been settled. <laughs> it's by Philip. Sorry, sorry, Luke. Sorry, Philip. A... I mean. It strikes me that a majority thinks the illusionists didn't win. I'll hang on to that. <laughs> it's as, fixed, as the, isn't it? The saying has become it's more been popular stolen. Lately, but Vox Populi, Vox Dei, so even God is on the side of illusionists. Like, what can we do? If well, someone doesn't is... believe in consciousness but does believe in God, then I have a lot of questions. <laughs> Don't tempt me. I, I, I think there's obviously been major vote rigging in this case. I think that's pretty clear. I think we need we need to reinvestigate this. It's an ongoing question. Obviously, you can't settle such matters in such an easy way. <sighs> oh, really? Uh, uh you you need to start you need to start uh, contacting your followers on social media and uh, spreading the this word. This is not about, the end of this. This is about not the, the end steel. of this. You, you, I'm not you're definitely going quietly. Start networking and um, getting. Uh, yep, yep. I'm and sure. as Luke get says, you, get the, your majority, lawyers on the majority of voters did not support illusionism. So I think that's pretty that's conclusive. small comfort. It's first past the post, I'm afraid. Wait, why is it first past the post? Why isn't this a proportional representation yeah. system where everything is now going to depend You'll on who formed the coalition with who? You'll be hearing from our lawyers. We'll assume that the, it was a draw. People would divide equally, would di if 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 pressed. Well, we'll run this again next Christmas. I think that'd be a good idea.
I'll 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 work up my arguments a bit better. All right. Well, thanks, Luke and Francois. I think this has been really good fun. Actually, this is the most <laughs> fun I've the most fun I've ever had whilst having COVID. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, yep. I yeah, hope that's... that that record is never broken. Do please come again. Yes, indeed. Check out pleasure. the work of these guys. They're writing very good, interesting, stimulating stuff. And one of them might even be right. <laughs> Absolutely seconded. Uh, I couldn't agree more. They're both you know, doing wonderful work. Yeah, thanks a lot for the invite. And I also had a lot of fun debating with uh, Luke, Philippe, and hearing uh, the questions of Keith, who tortured Luke a little bit. But I think it was all in a very friendly spirit. So it was great. I mean, I feel like Keith was almost self-torturing. The, the idea of this magical awareness seems positively painful. I mean, it's painful. <laughs> I wear my heart on my sleeve, Luke. What can I do? I admire that. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, guys. Hope to see you soon. Take Absolutely. Care. Thank you very much. Oh, that was fun, wasn't it? I'm absolutely shattered now, though. Probably, I don't know. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I'm not sure that I'm not sure the self-medication with, with, with alcohol no. is, is the best when you have cut, but it probably it will seemed, help you to sleep. It seemed a good idea at the time, but now I'm, I'm feeling a bit... <laughs> probably the right thing to do is just to keep on drinking, isn't it, I think? I, 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 I always I'm go with my intuitions. I always go with my intuitions, Keith. And that's what my just, intuitions, they've, never, they've never led me astray before, and that's what my intuitions are telling me right Okay, Philip, if you say. Okay. Yeah, it's, I think. It's been a great episode, I think. A, a great return to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to form, to. Uh, Our former glory. Absolutely. We must, we must continue this throughout the course of the year. Forever until our dying day. Uh, so, uh, and even on that day. So, I'll see you next Wednesday, eight PM UK time for. I yes, I shall look forward our to it. chat with the wonderful uh, Frank Jackson. And that should be persuading. good. That should be another episode not to miss. Absolutely, but no. But I mean, you say you won, but I think <laughs> what this established really conclusively is that all four of us agreed that consciousness is. Wherever, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I forgot how you do this. Just wait one second. I won't get it wrong this time. That all four of us conclusively agree that consciousness definitely is wherever it is and nowhere else. <laughs>